So the knights were the ones, yes, that saw the importance of our harbour in being very well defended, especially back in the 16th century. Aeroplanes were not yet invented, so the main target for the enemy would have had to be the coastal area. So the knights were the ones forking out a lot of money, commissioning military engineers, architects, local artisans to plan all these different cities you see today, which originally used to be only deserted peninsulas. So here to our left, you can see all of us used for building facilities. This over here in that fortress in general the heart in the harbor and it is named Victoriosa. So Victoriosa is in fact the city the knights had lived in initially until they were building bit by bit Valletta. The fortress at the tip of Victoriosa is known as Fort St. Angelo and nowadays also that has become the seat of the Knights of St. John here in Malta. Then on the other side of the Yacht Marina there is another fortified city and that's the one named Senglea, dating back to the year 1555. Both cities mostly are residential areas for Maltese families, just like all the other villages beyond the ones you can see ahead of you. It seems as if there is one big joint city, but those are all different villages, especially where you see a church or the dome of a church, then that is a different residential area. Then adjacent to Senglea, further to your right, where we have the yellow cranes, those are our dockyards. So that's where the majority of the reparation works for ships truly take place. And then further to your right, the harbour is completely closed, so all the ships coming in always have to go around this open space to face another time the exit. So that's the only entrance and exit leading in and out of the harbour. We call it the Grand Harbour. What is so grand about this harbour? This is still considered yeah, to be the, the biggest natural well. harbour in you see the two flags. Biggest that is the seat, natural. The fortress so of, all the uh, peninsulas and all the enclosed bays you see between one and the other, that was all naturally formed. And very naturally deep, because if not, all the cruise ships and aircraft carriers coming into our harbour could never berth exactly at the foot of the walls of Valletta. So it's very deep in a natural way as well. Catherine, the patron saint of Italy. Off and on is still open for services, not daily, but sometimes they do open it for services or maybe just a recital sometimes taking place over there. But then, although a lot of these buildings have survived the bombardments of the war, because you can see they have retained their original Baroque features, but we do have a souvenir of the Second World War. Just look behind me and you can see all these ruins this building that unfortunately has gone down to shambles nowadays. That used to be an opera house. And the Maltese people still say it used to be a jewel of an opera house inside the city, at least those Maltese that remember it standing on its face. But unfortunately, back in the 1940s, it just came down to these ruins because of the bombardments. This is the oldest building in Valletta, and the oldest church in Valletta. And it's right across from the opera house that was bombed during the Second World War.
his name was of state of the Commonwealth countries mm -hmm. and they had quite a gala dinner actually inside this palace. Then what is truly original in this room are the chandeliers. The chandeliers are made out of bohemian crystal. Those are more than 300 years old and luckily they have survived the bombardments of the war because this palace wasn't even touched during the war, miraculously. It just had to survive. They converted them into an electrical supply at the early 20th century. I mean, British period still, but very, very early 1900. Let me show you to the throne room. Originally known as the throne room because the Grand Master had his throne right at the far end of it. And they kept that same space for the chair reserved for the president today. In fact, they call it as well the Hall of the Supreme Council. It's where very important reunions are held in the palace. 
And some of the reunions that our presidents have had over here was, for instance, with the late Pope, John Paul II, that came to our harbor. The knights were only 600, and they fought their way against these Turks, helped by the Maltese people, and they won. The Maltese people won as well, because mainly we, we remained ruled by a very wealthy order. Okay, fair enough. But we stayed under a Roman Catholic order fundamental for the Maltese people at the time. Imagine if the Ottomans had won, then we would have to change quite a lot of the Maltese history. So every panel you are looking at depicts a, a different corner of our Grand Harbor. And you can see Ottomans in their turbans and Knights of St. John wearing their suit of armor. Something else I wanted to show you is this balcony. Because for the minstrels, for the musicians, because even at the time, out of boredom, because voyages took so long, the knights wanted some sort of entertainment during the voyage, and they used to have these minstrels, balconies, fitted on their galleys. The galley couldn't be used for navigation anymore, but they managed to save the balcony. And they brought it here, not only colors were inverted, so this was the vestment of the Knights of St. John. The Knights Templars was white with a red cross. Paying fully for the construction of Valletta, he even baptized the city, Valletta by his name. He never even made it to see the city, let alone live in it. Because Jean de Vallette died, and he died just by accident. He was hunting in one of our woodlands. He got a sunstroke, and he died at the age of 73. <coughs> Symbol of St. Paul. This is the hospital of the Knights, and it was considered the best hospital in Europe.
everything was naturally formed. Seagulls near the shore here in Malta. You really rarely see them. Okay, the fishermen always say they see them more when they are far out at sea, but not very near to the shore. Ideal breeding spot fact, for white sharks starts, and the largest and white shark ever discovered in the Mediterranean the was found the right off of this island. To a shark. And just not to alarm people, they say it's a big fish. <laughs> this lower part dates, well, the, the columns are 3000 BC. But <clears throat> in restoration, a few years ago, they put plaster on top of it, which is ruining the area. This is this is the area that's three thousand, the, the original. This is where they would tie up outside animals. Plan the same traditional plan for it. Now, when you look inside these apses. You can see that on the altars there is a very common design, the spiral design, the circular design that has no beginning, it has no end, and most probably symbolizes the continuity of life. Maybe for the soul in another dimension, as we believe, but notice one thing, we cannot go beyond prehistory, so most probably these communities had invented the spiral design, but other civilizations have copied it. Just like the Greeks in a circular form and the Romans in a labyrinthine rectangular version. They not only copied the design, they copied its definition. Because wherever the spiral was designed, it's because they wanted to refer to this eternal life, this continuity of life. They needed to give gifts to the god, but out of all the animals that they used to kill, did they simply throw away the meat? That would have been waste. The meat was surely eaten, so the meat would have been given back to the family that had donated the animal. They would collect its blood, and they would have kept it in, in cisterns, we call them maybe a piece of wood, yes, a wooden branch most probably, either tying them symmetrically, parallel, or diagonally, intercrossing each other, covering them up with animal skin, and there you go. You are hiding the inner part of the temple from the naked eye. The people maybe can only peek through the main door and see what was going on here, but not further than that, where the god is kept. On one of the temples, the interconnecting holes are found only to one slab, which is, it does make more sense, honestly enough, because if you tie a piece of wood only to one side, you've already got a pivot. It opens and it closes. So rather than bending and going underneath these wooden branches, you can simply open up a door. So most probably they were changing a bit of things in the temples, but not making drastic changes in the structure above all over there. Something interesting has been found in this apse. Have a look at this big cistern, which is also a copy of the original. Would have been filled up with water for the purification of the animal. Washing the animal before handing it over to the god. And I'm talking about purification because there is this stone slab beside me with a hole drilled in the heart of it. And they think that that hole might have been filled up with water as another libation hole, but maybe for the priest or the priestess to wash their hands in it as a basin, washing the animal in that cistern, and then yes, they were ready to offer the sacrifice. Something similar in our churches. Fountains with blessed water inside the church. You dip your finger, you do a cross on your forehead. That's all a symbolism of purification, just because we refer to it as the stone of the eternal fire. A fire that used to burn here 24-7, but what was its use? 
to light up the complex, heating the complex, maybe, maybe, if the temples were moved over. Because if the temples were left like this with no ceiling whatsoever, what's the use of lighting up a fire over here? But then when we go back to our churches, we always leave candles burning 24-7. Even if the church is closed, you always keep candles burning as a symbolism of your worship. But we know that the temples were roofed over. Archaeologists have a proof that the temples were roofed over, the water. And that's how the water was literally eating its aperture over here. Down to the very last slide bulb, those are only 80 meters. And this is from where they managed to recover all the bones we've seen up in the museum. Beyond that very last light bulb, they just couldn't get through anymore. The layers forming themselves inside the caves. So the deepest level in it is from where they managed to recover the hippopotami bones. So the bones of the hippopotamus are surely enough the oldest because the most recent level would be the very last one forming over here where we are now, almost up to the level of this railing. To the grand new museum they opened on the other
two, say hello, champ. One, two. simply because the temperature in a cave is always constant. It's never too cold, it's never too hot. But above all, they could simply get their family, get their animals and move in a cave gratis, free of charge. Nobody was going to tell them anything, nobody was going to charge them anything, no taxes involved. So they simply moved inside the cave. And a cave as big as this in St. Martin's wouldn't have held just one family, but there would have been six to seven families living as a community, literally, in just one cave. So there would have been, yes, a population of about maybe 36 people living in an area like this. So maybe the ladies would have had their own communal kitchen, but then you would have had sections split up just as bedrooms for the family. And if you look at some parts in the walls, you have the interconnecting holes that we've seen by the temples. Where all, you ever see those interconnecting holes, it was either for them to tie animals, so they would have left them beside them in the caves. They would have left the cave as a shed even for animals, maybe tying something else. Maybe some of their household goods would have been lying, hanging around the cave. But imagine splitting a cave with other people, with another family. There wouldn't have been a lot of privacy, surely enough. Living in a cave together with other animals as well. It wouldn't have been so hygienic. No electricity, no tap water, no facilities, because there wouldn't have been any restrooms over here. <laughs> they would have to avail themselves of the natural habitat that there is in the surrounding area. So what happened? During the British period, in the mid-1940s, the British, just because they were seeing a lot of families living in such an unhygienic condition, they forced them to move out. St. Paul. Get about all the embellishments and all the decorations you see behind me. There were no marble columns, no golden mosaic decorations, none, none of these embellishments. There used to be just this tiny cave that lies exactly behind me. Another time, naturally hewn into the rock. And the local inhabitants of Beliha say that this cave was the one blessed by St. Paul the Apostle himself. So when St. Paul reached our shore in the year 60 after Christ, made his way over to Beliha, not only to preach Christianity to who used to be pagan people, because the Maltese were pagan before the arrival of St. Paul, but most probably he was the one that consecrated this cave. Maybe even celebrated some of the very first services that we might have had here on the island. So just imagine the popularity that this cave then started to have in the long run. Not only because it was visited according by the local people by St. Paul himself, but because of the image that lies on the rock face of the cave. Because if you look just behind the altar, there is a wrought iron frame housing an image of Virgin Mary breastfeeding baby Jesus. And according to local belief, that image of Virgin Mary was painted directly on the rock face by Saint Luke. And this is Adam and Eve.
This was possibly painted by St. Luke. Absolutely. So St. Paul Church is built inside a cave. This came from was the chapel, which is in a cave. The egg-shaped dome. And this is the egg-shaped dome, because there are a lot of eggs produced poultry in this area. Third largest dome in Europe. Of Virgin Mary and they still house a statue over here in fact in that illuminated niche that lies exactly ahead of me and where Virgin Mary is always exposed to the people but then during the feast days so a little bit before the 15th of August up until the day of the proper feast they would take out the statue of Virgin Mary and put it here right in the center of the church for everybody to see adorn it with flowers light up candles until then in the evening on the 15th of August when they take her out in procession and they do quite a big festivity as well here in the village of Mosta. And one can easily see that this church is dedicated to Virgin Mary due to the fact that all the walls inside the church have been painted in this very light blue color. We attribute this baby blue color to the cloak Virgin Mary is always seen wearing if it is on a statue. If she is represented on painting, she's always seen wearing this very light blue veil on her head as well. But this church here in Mosta had originally been planned by a Maltese architect. His name was Giorgio Gronier du Vas, and it was built between 1833 and 1860. So they spent 27 years just to finish off the construction of this building, but 27 years were needed mainly because this church was built just by donations. So it was the parish priest himself that went literally knocking door to door, pleading money from these local people because there was the need for a much bigger church to be constructed over here. So at least a lot of volunteers as well then came over, giving a hand in the construction of the building. So at the end of the day, this building was constructed by people that were not paid for the work they were doing people that were just taking it literally as a hobby in coming over to the construction site and help with the erection of this brand new church but 27 years were also needed for its construction mainly because this church was built on the same technique they used for the pantheon with no support whatsoever in fact, they discovered that such a construction technique preserved itself even better in time. And the Maltese architect wanted to do Mosta Church similar to the Pantheon. I mean similar in style, not in size, because in comparison to the Pantheon, this is just like its baby. But at the end of the day, it has this circular form. So no wonder in Maltese we call it the Rotunda the rounded church and in fact as a perfectly circular church this is the only one we have on the Maltese islands but let us not only talk about the construction of this church and when it had been built let me take you back to another phase in time let me take you back to the 1940s and to a specific evening on the 9th of April of 1942 when a bomb, which was thrown by a German plane, pierced the dome of this church exactly on your right-hand corner by the main altar. Whilst piercing the dome, this bomb fell inside the building without exploding. And so the people started saying that it was a miracle, it had to be. It was Virgin Mary that was watching over them and that is why the bomb did not explode. Could be. 
miracles do happen sometimes, but there is a true supposition how come this bomb never exploded. They discovered it was a sabotaged bomb. And if you go back in time, you might remember that a lot of Jews that were obliged to work in for the Germans in Poland used to manufacture a lot of bombs and armaments which they used to sabotage because they did not wish to kill anybody with the armaments they were obliged to manufacture. So most probably we turned out to be so lucky as to have an empty bomb piercing the dome of one of our biggest churches. Because, okay, the bomb did a few damages, I mean a hole in the dome, which was repaired then after the war, breaking some tiles whilst landing inside the building, but breaking nobody's head at the end of the day because when the bomb fell inside the church there was a congregation of 300 people and all of them were seated just a few feet away from where the bomb landed so imagine nobody was seated in that particular spot did they know that a bomb was going to to pierce the dome of the church surely not did they know where a bomb was going to land during those air raids surely not so we have to attribute part of this story to American. Maybe really Virgin Mary wanted this church to survive, to stand on its feet again. Why was Mosta air raided as well? Not that far away from the village of Mosta, the British had another military airfield. So most probably the target for the German Luftwaffe was the British airfield. But then whatever lay in the surrounding areas had to be in a way destroyed as well. So unfortunately, even the village of Mosta suffered quite a lot of damages. The original bomb today is exhibited in the war museum there is in Valletta, in the capital city. What they have in the sacristy of this church is a cast, a true copy of the original bomb. But what is original and exposed in the sacristy are the black and white photographs they took on that afternoon when the bomb fell. And when you look at the pictures, especially looking at the place where the bomb fell by the main altar, you can have an idea then where the place exactly is today inside this church. So we would like to leave you a bit, not only to take pictures inside the building, you can roam anywhere you like, but if you'd like to walk to the sacristy to see how, how big a bomb this this one was, even just by looking at its copy, the sacristy is where those people are walking through onto your left hand side. Then we'll just meet outside the church please at 11.30. St. John the Baptist baptizing Christ. That's the copy and that's it. come to visit a palace that was originally built in the year 1733 and it had been built by one of the Grand Masters of the Order of the Knights, a Portuguese Grand Master whose name was Antonio Manuel de Villena. And this Portuguese Grand Master simply wanted to build a palace that would only serve as a weekend retreat 
So whenever this grandmaster needed to move away from noisy, chaotic Valletta, he had somewhere else to come to. But what happened? Being himself the Grand Master of the Order, he never really had the time to move away from the capital city. So this palace remained barren of all decorations. Until the time came when this residence was taken over by a Sicilian nobleman whose name was Parisio. So Parisio, apart from taking up residence in this palace, named the palace as well. Hence why even today it is known as Palazzo Parisio. And Parisio was the one that used to come only on and off to this residence. In fact, he was only using it as a summer residence. And he only added a few embellishments to it until the time came in the last period of the 1800s when the palace was taken over by this noble family that owns it today, the Maltese family by the name of Shikluna. But this Maltese noble family decided to take up residence permanently inside Palazzo Parisio. And whatever they have put inside the palace was done to their own tastes. So all the furniture was brought over from Milan in Italy. All the marble work was done in Carrara and Siena, so coming from Italy as well. And all the beautiful light fittings you will see upstairs inside the palace all those light fittings you will see are made in Venice, in Murano. The family was a very wealthy one, even at the time, not only because of inheritance being a noble family, but they had a lot of business going on here in Malta. Family Shikluna, above all, were property negotiators. They were the very first people in Malta to open a private bank in Valletta, and the very first ones to introduce checks on the island as a method of payment. Yeah. They even owned a brewery. And the Sisk Lager, the beer we have in Malta, was invented by family Shikluna. And apart from that, they even owned a fleet of steamships with which they used to negotiate grain in the Mediterranean. So you can see from where the family was getting all of its wealth. And all the work inside the palace was done within a span of six years. Between 1900 and 1906, there were not less than 50 artisans working at one go to finish off everything inside the palace. But we can say that we are already surrounded by some of the family members. Let me introduce you to them. Just over there in the corner, we have the very first Marquis Shikluna, and his name was Emanuele. So Emanuele was one of the very first members of family Shikluna to take up residence permanently over here at the end of the 1800s. Because the gentleman I have here to my side was his son. Giuseppe Cicluna, the second Marquis. And Giuseppe was the one responsible for all the work that was done in the palace in the beginning of the 20th century. But although all the work was over by 1906, unfortunately Giuseppe died just one year later, in 1907. Right beside me on the other side, we have this picture portrait of the third Marchioness. She was Giuseppe's granddaughter, and her name was Violetta Testaferrata. And on the other side, we have another picture portrait of one of her daughters, the most noble Corini Shikluna, who unfortunately passed away last year in January at the age of 85. Mm. Corinne was one of the few family members that were still living in one wing of the palace. Today, there are just a few members of the family Shikluna that are residing in this palace again. But they have these beautiful gardens, as you can see right ahead of us. So the gardens, together with some of the rooms upstairs, are the ones surely sought after by quite a lot of couples that would like to have their wedding reception or a wedding banquet over here. But let me show you even more than this, by these beautiful marble slabs. But one very interesting piece of marble is the upper part of this banister. This is one solid piece of Carrara marble, but it is not the very first piece that was intended to be brought inside the palace by the family, because the very first piece of marble that the family had bought in Italy was meant to be shipped over to Malta, but during the voyage, the ship sunk, and that marble was lost at sea. 
they tried a second time. They managed to ship it over safely to the island, but when they were literally dragging it inside the palace, this piece of marble fell. It broke into two chunks, and they literally had to dispose of it because the marquee didn't want a broken marble slab. Usually they say, third time lucky. And it happened over here because to manage to bring this piece of marble safe and sound inside the palace, the family enrolled the British artillery and they carried it using not less than 40 mules. So this is the third piece of marble the family had to pay for at the time. But it is one solid piece of Carrara marble. Let me take you up to this other hall rules as you see it over here. The <laughs> Lombarda Hall, and simply because of the style the furniture is in, it's a Lombardian styled furniture. All the furniture made out of walnut, tailor made in Milan, so as to be placed in this particular room inside the palace. Apart from having this set of beautiful paintings surrounding us, in their majority done by Italian artists, with the exception of these two flanking the mirror behind me, that were done by a Maltese artist whose name was Francesco Zara, dating back to the 17th century. Then there is that beautiful white Carrara marble fireplace at the far end. All the fireplaces inside the palace used to have cast iron stoves fitted inside them. They've polished it and cleaned it to bring it back to its original state. But what lies also here in the corner beside me is this piano, which is a Bechstein piano. It was made in Berlin and it used to belong to Marquis Giuseppe Cicluna. This is the same piano that they use today whenever there is a function inside the palace. So they are still using that very early 20th century Berlin piano. But there is another lovely feature I wanted to show you, not only inside this room, but in the majority of the rooms we'll be going into. Have a look at the walls, particularly when you look at them at a distance. There appears to be some sort of wallpaper covering up the walls. Damask hangings, the walls are all hand-painted and they have been hand-painted to give out that illusion that some sort of fabric or material maybe is covering up the walls, but that is all hand-paint, what you are looking at. Let me show you the dining room this time. We wanted to adorn it with a very different theme. In fact, the dining room we have over here has a very Pompeian style, especially these bright, vivid colors on the walls, mythological figures on some of the windows as well. These Neapolitan scenes that you can see on both paintings. This room not only takes you back to the city of Pompeii, but above all to the Roman era. So if the family wanted to stick to that subject, they couldn't light up this room by hanging crystal chandeliers, for instance. They wouldn't mingle that well with the theme the room had. So they decided to hang the bronze oil lamps, fitting smaller ones on some of the furniture as well. But what happened? If they were going to burn oil to light up the room, the smoke would ruin all the artwork on the walls. So the family decided to install in the palace a diesel generator. Family Shikluna was the very first family in the whole of Malta to have electricity at home. And that was at the very beginning of the 20th century. Even here, all the furniture is all walnut and this is all hand chiseled and made in Italy, in Milan, also specifically for family Shikluna. And when you look at the crockery on the side furniture, the ones sat on the table, that was all made by Royal Dalton for family Shikluna. The crystal ware on the table is a mixture of Tower Bridge and Waterford. So we have a mixture of glasses here, English and Irish crystal ware on the table. What is not original on this table is the silver. The solid silver cutlery that the family owns has been stored away under lock and key. They've made an exact copy of it 
just to give the public an idea how the family silver really looks like. But then what is truly original and Maltese on this table is the lace. So the placemats and the napkins are all bordered with lace, which is made out with bobbins. And that is surely a craft that has remained very popular up till today on the Maltese islands. Let me show you to another room, just adjoining this one. Adi, belonging to Marquis Giuseppe Cicluna. Downstairs I showed you his bust. Over here we have his photograph. The gentleman we have here in the corner is Marquis Giuseppe Cicluna. And right next to him we have his wife Corinna. But there is another interesting photograph in the study. Have a look at the picture just behind the desk. And it portrays a columned building by the seaside. The seaside is St. Julian's. The columned building, our casino, the Dragonara Palace. Because the Dragonara Palace was the summer residence of family Shikluna. When Corinna widowed, they just decided to lease it over to a company, which in, in the end then opened it up as a casino. So it's still on leasing. The casino still belongs to family Shikluna. Have a look at the walls even over here. These are entirely hand-painted, but apart from having these beautiful hand-painted walls, have a look at the ceiling. The ceiling is entirely adorned with those stucco reliefs, gilded over, and all the gold leaf all over the palace is 24 karat gold leaf. Have a look at the fringe on the upper part of the walls. That is not fabric. That is stucco as well, painted over and gilded over one more time. Mm. Then just adjacent to me, we have this library with a few of the books that belonged to Marquis Giuseppe Cicluna, highly educated because Giuseppe knew how to read not only in Maltese and English, but he had a lot of books in Italian and French at the time as well. And in this library, they still have the whole ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The ninth edition, just to give you an idea, was the one published in 1887. And they still have the complete set of it over here. Let me show you to a more private fact, it is the only one you'll be able to see inside the palace. This is the only one they have left open to the public because all the other bedrooms and the bathrooms they have in Palazzo Parisio lie just beyond these walls and they lie in the wing of the palace where the family still resides today. But this bedroom was the one originally belonging to the married couple, to Giuseppe and Corinna, the ones we saw their photographs in the study. And when you look at the furniture over here, just see all the details that have been chiseled out of this walnut. Those have all been chiseled out with hand tools. And imagine just to ship them over as well from Milan over to Malta. Not only the manufacturing of it might have costed lump sums of money for the family, but just to bring them over from Italy to Malta, it would have costed them quite a lot, surely enough at the time. When you look at the hand-painted walls over here, we have this golden shimmer always using the golden color to emanate more light inside the room, especially when you leave the windows open and you get these sun rays lighting up these, this golden color on the walls. And even here, another beautiful ceiling because this is all stucco, what you are looking at. Another time covered in gold leaf together with the fringe. Because even that fringe, neither here, just like the study, this is not fabric. Even that is made out of stucco, painted, gilded over once again. And then the central panel in the ceiling portrays the image of the Immaculate Conception, a symbol during your sleep, but the Immaculate Conception, a symbolism of fertility when one is talking about the bedroom above all. Then on one side, we have the ladies' boudoir, so that was the place where Corinna used to prepare her toilette before moving out of the palace, more of a lady room in fact. And on the other side, also winter connecting with the bedroom, is the chapel. It was very common amongst noble families to have their own chapel fitted inside their residence.
room. In fact, this was the room the ladies usually used to come to after dinner. Because when dinner was over, the gentlemen used to congregate somewhere else. Maybe smoke a cigar or a pipe, taking a sip of brandy, <coughs> talking, business. <coughs> Women had to be out of that. So the ladies had to come over to another room, maybe weaving some tapestry, doing some sort of needlework in this room, and be entertained with music. In fact, it is known as the ladies' music room, and the subject revolving itself around this room is music. When you look at all the furniture, you can see musical instruments carved in the wood as well. And if you look at the ceiling, each and every corner has a set of musical instruments, also carved out in stucco reliefs, and some of the cherubs are shown playing music as well. But when it comes to the walls inside this room, this time they are not hand painted, but the walls are covered in silk moiré, or as we call it, watermark silk. So yes, this is fabric this time, but something interesting as well are the curtains. These are the original curtains dating back to the early 20th century. They were made in Paris and they had been sewn using nine carat gold thread. There is another lovely white Carrara marble fireplace even over here. And have a look at the floor because the majority of the rooms we have been walking through have their floors made out of mosaic. And just in remembrance of when the palace had been built during the Grand Masters period, they made out the eight-pointed cross out of mosaic as well, as a symbol for the Knights of St. John. Let me show you the, the ballroom inside the palace. The ballroom to the Grand Masters of the Order simply remembering that the palace had been built originally by one of them in the 18th century. So when you look above each and every doorway surrounding us, you can see a figure representing some of the grand masters that we have had ruling Malta at the time. But at one glance inside this room, it does remind us a bit of the Hall of Mirror in Versailles, or at least a miniature of the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, because with these two chandeliers reflected into all these mirrors in the surrounding area, you already get that illusion of infinity. And the room seems longer, and it seems wider than it truly is. Talking about the chandeliers, even these have been handcrafted, made out of bronze, and just to give you an idea, every single chandelier weighs not less than one ton. And just bear in mind that they already had an electrical supply fitted into them because of the diesel generator the family had inside the palace. They use this room nowadays for civil weddings, or if a couple would want to have their wedding reception inside rather than in the gardens, they would use the ballroom, they would open up the Lombarda Hall, and that's where the musicians would stay, just because of the piano as well. Gentlemen, the billiard room. In fact, Marquis Giuseppe Cicluna had two billiard tables specifically done for him. This one and another one to be taken to the summer residence, what is today the casino. And both billiard tables were made out of Cuban mahogany. And they were made in London by a company known as Thurston & Co. But these were specifically made for Giuseppe Cicluna because when you look at the billiard table, this is larger than normal. This billiard table is not less than 15 feet long and it has one solid piece of slate covering it all over. Today they cover it up so well just for protection, especially because using the ballroom as one of the venue rooms, unfortunately the waiters tend to plop all their dishes on the billiard table, so they just had to cover it up completely. But you can see how the Cuban mahogany really looks like over here, not only for the billiard table, but even for the scoreboard that we have at the far end, even that is Cuban mahogany. Another different piece of wood are the elevated seatings because they are entirely made out of oak, purposely elevated so that the 
spectators could easily look onto the center of the table and watch the game. And the table is illuminated with these beautiful Murano light glass fittings, supported by solid bronze angels. And not only that, keep following the chain up to the ceiling. The chain arrives up to a central panel, which at a distance appears to be a woven tapestry that has been stretched and pinned to the ceiling. But that is hand painted as well. In fact, the ceiling is a beautiful trompe l'oeil, a beautiful optical illusion when you look at it, as is a beautiful optical illusion, the hand-painted walls, because these truly look just like damask with the contrast they have used with, with the colors that there are over here. But this time we'll have to make our way downstairs, just because they're waiting for us to have our lunch, most probably in the gardens. Hello. Hello. <laughs> we meet again. Yes. <laughs> this is where we had lunch at the palace. This is the island of Gozo. We took the ferry over to Malta. store the the boats fishing boats this is on Goza Island rented a car in my Tell me where the safe deposit was. and it had a stick ship <laughs> so driving around the parking lot practicing. And I am recording my last will and testament on the, on the Wow. Hey, 
Okay, see you later. <laughs> oh, don't mind. Another four. Two in the front. Two in the front. The very first one. Take your time, take your time. No problem. Okay. Come on then.
knock it out. Where the Pope came. Very beautiful. It's a basilica. This is looking out over the fields from the church, the basilica. This is looking out from the church, the basilica, and there are stations of the cross along the mountain or the hill over there. Point for the capital city of Victoria. And that is why the Gauzetins, since always, have called the citadel the Acropolis. So the highest point overlooking what is today the capital city. But on board the van I was telling you that not only this turns out to be the only fortress that lies in Gozo, because when you look around you see that Gozo is not as very well fortified as Malta is. So nobody really ever bothered in spending money to fortify this little island. But the citadel turned out to be the safest place that the Gauzetans have ever had through a lot of different centuries. Neither Phoenicians, nor Romans, nor Arabs, not even the Knights of St. John the Baptist were interested in wasting money, they used to say, for fortifying Gozo. Gozo is small, vulnerable, it would be not only a waste of money for them, but it would have been a weight as well. So they always pushed Gozo a bit aside. They always financed the 
the construction of fortresses and observation towers in Malta. That's where they had their headquarters. But Gozo was always known, unfortunately, as the Forgotten Island. So much forgotten that it turned out to be an easy target for the enemy. Gozo suffered very harsh invasions at the time, particularly by the Ottomans. The harshest one happened in 1551 when a fleet of 20,000 Ottomans landed in Gozo in the main harbor of Imjar, that's from where they came through, and they swept away with them 6,000 slaves. 6,000 back in the 16th century was almost all the population of Gozo. They took away with them all men, women, children, all those people that were fit and healthy enough to work as slaves, working in the fields, rowing the galleys whenever the Ottomans maybe were going through a battle as well. So unfortunately we know for sure that those 6,000 slaves never even returned back to this island. First of all because nobody could ransom them. The few godsitans that remained here were too poor to pay their returning back. But also because in Tripoli there is a place by the name of Tartuna where descendants of those Gossetans are still residing. So from their family name, we know that those Gossetans at the time, unfortunately, not only worked and lived as slaves, but died in Tripoli, never managing to return back to the island. And after that invasion of 1551, it was compulsory for the few Gossetans that were left here in Gozo to sleep inside the citadel. So there was a curfew they had to respect and at night time they had to literally close themselves inside this fortress. In fact, this is the original entrance leading one into the citadel. And at the time, this used to have a, a wooden entrance closing it, a wooden doorway that they have removed for a very simple reason. Just because the cathedral is dedicated to the Assumption of Virgin Mary, and they used to do a, just a small procession within the citadel because the space is very limited here. One fine day, the bishop came up with the good idea of taking the statue of Virgin Mary down to Victoria with the band marches, the fireworks displays, so they very fast removed the wooden doorway. They tried to get through with the statue of Virgin Mary, but the Madonna couldn't pass, neither from width and nor from height. The archway was too small for the statue. So they kept on doing the feast only inside the citadel until the 1980s came along. And with the 1980s, there came along as well the only lady president that we have ever had throughout the presidencies. Her name was Agatha Barbara. And Agatha Barbara came up with the brilliant idea of opening up that huge archway where we've stopped with our minivan. But this president, apart from ruining a fortification wall dating back to the 17th century, imagine just by literally drilling a hole in it, she ruined the view of the citadel. Because if one comes through the tiny archway and you go through these narrow winding routes and come up to the big square where the cathedral is, you almost get a surprise because you don't expect to find a big square in such a tiny place. But nowadays that surprise is ruined. You just come up from the stairway of Victoria, you face the huge archway, that huge hole in the wall, and there you go. You've seen the cathedral, you've seen everything. And in fact, the Gozitans do have a saying about President Agatha Barbara, because they say whatever the barbarians did not manage to do during those invasions was done back in the 1980s by Agatha Barbara. Nowadays, it is a big help, yes, for the Gozitans to have that huge archway, because they do come down in procession with Virgin Mary, they go down the winding route into Victoria, and they make a big festival. Let me show you the facade of the cathedral from here. This is the main square for the citadel and the big archway that was done by President Agatha Barbara at the time. Together with the residence of the Gozitan Bishop to my left hand side and the Court of Justice just facing it on the parallel side. So at least the Gossetans have their own Court of Justice. They have no need to come over to Valletta and Malta whenever they have the need to make use of it. A set of walls, one wall surrounding the entire square, so each and every stairway you might be taking to go up for the view if you would like to you on those walls, then automatically they would bring you back down to the same square. 
automatically one always reaches the square of the cathedral. This is the cathedral that the Knights of St. John had to rebuild after the shakings of that Sicilian earthquake happening in 1693. So this cathedral is the one dating back to 1697, almost finished by 1711. I say almost finished because this church is not yet complete. The Knights of St. John did not donate enough money for the completion of the cathedral. So the Godetans couldn't finish off this church with the construction of a dome. This is the only flat-top church there is on the entire island of Gozo. But the Godetans, artistically enough, completed the church by painting a trompelel an optical illusion of a dome on the flat circular structure above the main altar there is what appears to be a spherical dome but everything is completely flat and all the columns that lie on this painting and the windows all those features are all painted but it is so beautifully done three-dimensional that it seems as if yes there is a dome whenever you look at the ceiling of the cathedral but the cathedral the structure itself is completely flat and that is also at least a reminder of what the knights of saint john had done for the little island of Gozo. So if you would like to visit the cathedral, then you have to get a ticket with the audio guide as well accompanying you. And the entrance is just this little doorway through this archway on the left hand side. As I was telling you, any balustraded stairway you'll take up to the fortification walls, it automatically would lead you back down to the cathedral square. Then to go down to Victoria, either through the barbarian arch which is the big one we have here or else out of the little archway from where we came in always taking the stairway into victoria the one that has the railings on either side of it and we'll see you down there in the market square 20 past. at 20 past 12 please okay 20 past 12. this is inside the cathedral at the citadel And this dome is actually flat. That's painted. And even though it looks curved, it's flat. And that's another view of the flat dome. just painted. This is looking back at the door. And this is taken from the door of the cathedral, looking down onto Victoria. Taken from the top of the citadel in Victoria.
Sì, sì, però viene male. And this is from the top of the wall of the citadel in Gozo. We'll come right around. Down below is Victoria. A lot of the fields. And then over here, we have the cathedral, where the flat dome was, was painted. These are prickly pear cacti. This is another view looking down on Victoria from the Citadel. And here we see the cathedral. There's where the flat dome would be. And another view looking more straight out from the cathedral onto Victoria. It's now noon. Telling you on board the van that these people coming over from Sicily purposely chose flat topped hills, promontories where they were building their temples at the time. Because if you look just behind you, you can already see quite a big part of the coastal area, although it is a bit hazy. And when the visibility is very good, from this side of Gozo, you can also see Malta beyond. The visibility is a bit hazy today, but obviously enough back in the prehistory, surely enough that the sea level was pretty much lower than it is today. So this was higher and surely enough safer. That's why these people were always choosing high spots, flat topped hills to build their temples, maybe build their lodgings, but a safe place for their community to live in. Now I was telling you as well on board the van that the temples that we have just behind me, the Gigantia temples, were always visible. 
people knew about their existence, but people didn't know what these structures were. Up until the excavation started, an archaeologist started uncovering these tables made out of stone and thinking they might be altars. So if you have an altar, then you might have a place of worship and an idol that these people are worshipping. And that's from where then the studies began, that these might be temples, places of worship, sacred shrines, even for the offering of sacrifices. But there was a point in the old centuries when people were simply passing by these structures, thinking that maybe one day Gozo was inhabited by giants because only they could build these temples, attributing these temples to a giantess. That's why they call them Gigantia temples. Legend has it, in fact, because the Gozitans then started saying a lot of stories about the construction of the buildings, that it was a giantess that built these temples, carrying the huge boulders on her shoulder from the village of Shara, from where we came, the baby on her breast, coming over to the area of construction, literally throwing one boulder on top of the other just to erect a building. Luckily, we know that that is not the case, but there were engineers, there were architects involved to be able to build these temples because if these people were not architects, these temples would have never survived. Thousands of years standing as you see them today, although unfortunately, the upper level of the temples has completely fallen over. A lot of the boulders that used to be on the uppermost part of it are the ones you see today here as a rubble literally on the foot of the facade of the temples because even these, apart from weathering and all sorts of erosion, they've suffered shakings of earthquakes as well. So for 5,600 years, surely enough, they could have never remained in the pristine condition they would have been when they were constructed. But at least we came to know, thanks to all the excavations that were done that yes just like the temples we have in Malta these were also the ones used for the offering of these sacrifices thanks also to the numerous animal bones that were discovered literally interred within the temple structure itself notice at the foot of these scaffoldings lying behind me there are a lot of the rolling stones the circular boulders so the rolling stones had already been invented been used already when these very first people settled on our archipelago. It's not something they invented when they went over to Malta and built the other temples. They were already using these rolling stones to roll the bigger boulders on top of them, using them as a means of transportation, using them as well as a kind of safety as well for the erect megalith just to leave it in place to leave it standing now the only thing is they did not discover a lot of things in gigantia temples i will be showing you yes altars i will be showing you designs inside the temples but where are the statuettes where are all the other altars that used to be situated in the side apses as we found in Malta? Most probably a lot of artifacts from these temples would have been stolen because they were always visible. Most probably this was even used as a playground for kids for a very long time. And kids maybe finding figurines, thinking they looked like dolls, they would have taken them away. I mean, this is something very logical and that is why we've ended up with less things as a temple should have inside it if it was really used for sacrifices, especially knowing that there was already a population of about 10,000 people living here 5,600 years ago. To go inside the temples, as we will be doing within a few seconds, we will be going up quite a few steps and those are the original steps that they had done for the temples so that is also a symbolism of importance we always have a flight of steps or maybe just a few steps going up to a church we're going to a higher level so we're going to something which is more important that's why we need to go up a level higher and that is what they've also let us say introduced not just invented when they were building the gigantia temples the doorway of the temples unfortunately is not complete the temples always had to have three lithic doorways over here what have survived are the two vertical megaliths as you will be seeing 
the lintel, the horizontal megalith on top, fails. So most probably it is one of the many boulders that have toppled over in the long run. But Gigantia temples were roofed over as well, according to our archaeologists. So now you have to visualize that in your mind. So you have to think how the temples might have looked like when they were roofed over, because even that has disappeared in time. But the structure is original and all the artifacts that lie inside are still original over here. Over here they haven't done any copies to exchange them with the original ones. They've only taken a few artifacts to the Museum of Archaeology, but apart from that all the rest was left over here. Let me take you inside the abscess. Where was their water supply? Water supply, they had much more rainfall than we had today. And even if they dug in the ground, there was a lot of table water at the time. You can see not only the rolling stones, but these are the slabs they were using as steps leading into the temple. Now appreciate the fact that this particular slab is one whole stone. So this would have been quarried in that width, transported and placed over here as you see it today. This wasn't cut in pieces. This is one unique slab as you see it over here. Another small step, so we're raising a bit more to be able to go in the temple. These are the two erect megaliths you see on either side. So just imagine that over here there is a horizontal slab that would have completed the entrance to the temple itself. And what lies at the foot of the slab is what we call a libation fountain. So this is a cistern, most probably filled up with water, not blood. They would have had, yes, libation fountains or libation cisterns where the blood would have been collected after the sacrifice, as we've seen as well in Malta. But lying by the main door, it would have made more sense for them to put water here, always as a symbolism of purification before entering the house of the, the god or the goddess they were worshipping at the time. Maybe either washing their hands or as low as it is, easier to wash your feet inside. But always a symbolism of purification in front of the god. Watch your step going in and I will take you to the inner axis. Thanking us and you can see the corbelling system they were using for the construction of the temples. Mm. Big boulders, yes, placed as a jigsaw puzzle, but then fitting smaller ones in the gaps as an additional support for them. And they might have kept on with this corbelling system as high as they could reach, but they would have never made a roof out of stone over here because there is no plastering involved. So a roof wouldn't have really stuck these boulders one to the other with no plastering. So most probably the kind of roofing they had over here was a sort of crisscrossing with wooden trunks, even weaving through them palm leaves as our archaeologists mm. think, but such soft materials. They would have had to remake the ceilings most probably year after year, because even after a storm everything would have toppled over completely. So they would have had to maintain the temples year after year. You might have noticed that there are additional steps, two more steps leading us to the first two apses. So we're always rising here to a higher level and this apse is said to have been the one where the sacrifices would have been offered only due to the fact that there are so many things inside it. First of all, steps another time leading you to a higher place at the very far end. What remains of columns flanking the steps and two altars at the front, which unfortunately are, are the original ones. I'm saying unfortunately because the spiral design on their facade is slowly fading away. So the spiral design also here, symbolizing the continuity of life, this eternal life that has no beginning and has no end. But the curiosity is that in this other apse, they have discovered a stone slab which has been taken to the Museum of Archaeology. A slab that has almost my height and rather than having the spiral design and carved on it, it had a winding snake. And archaeologists say that as the snake changes the skin, the soul might change the body. But then we're talking about reincarnation. 
which is a different continuity of life. So could these people believe in reincarnation rather than in the soul reaching another dimension as then we believe as well? So there was also this big question mark. What did the continuity of life really, uh, let us say, seem for these people? How did they really depict it when they were doing all these designs and reliefs? But we think that the animal would have been sacrificed over here just because of the numerous things that one finds in this semicircular apse. Then at the very far end we have the main altar just at the foot of the scaffoldings and interesting to notice is that on the facade of the main altar as there lie as well on the facade of this other step is another design a pitting design those holes are not erosion they are a decoration symmetrically done very patiently done most probably with the finest and sharpest animal bones and the pitting designs were always discovered on the most important places of the temples always on the main altar and always on the step whenever there was one leading to the main altar so notice, you are always rising a step higher until finally you reach the place where the god is exposed at the very far end. This is the carving on this step. Visibility is really good. You can even see the Hilton Tower from there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Look at the sound. And there's our boat. Yeah, We've got to go down. Yeah, it's it natural. So natural. No, that's not natural. They do. That's some man-made boat. When you're ready, let's um, go back on the bus so that we don't miss the boat. That's Malta that we're coming into. It's exactly beyond not only this bridge entirely made out of limestone, but let us not forget about the set of fortification walls enclosing the entire city and this dry moat. This is the dry moat that originally the Arabs had dug. Always dry, it had never been filled up with water and also the moat keeps on going all around the city, just outside the fortification walls. But although we will be using what is today the main gateway for the city of Medina, unfortunately, I will have to tell you that that is not the original gate of the city, as is not original half of the city, because half of Medina was totally destroyed by an earthquake. 
that same Sicilian earthquake happening in Catania on the 10th of January of 1693. Such a terrible earthquake, it shook both our islands, Malta and Gozo, and it made quite a big devastation, unfortunately, in Medina, because it lies on one of our high spots. Just because of that Sicilian earthquake, half of the city totally collapsed. Half of the city that not only consisted in its original entrance, it consisted as well in a number of palaces. I mean, imagine noble families that just one fine day woke up with no residence whatsoever. And what was lost as well was the cathedral. So the cathedral I will be showing you today is not the original church that Medina had long ago. But luckily, in a way, just because the earthquake happened in the 17th century, that was the time Malta was under the rule of the Knights of St. John. So the Knights were the ones to pay for all the reconstructions that Medina needed, but what did the Knights of the Order say? If we are going to finance everything, then we'll do everything in our own style. And they introduced the Baroque architecture in what used to be originally an Arabic city. So what you see over here today, this was entirely remodeled by the Knights of St. John. But there is another small bit of Medina that miraculously knew nothing about that Sicilian earthquake. It is still intact, original, Arabic up to this very day. When we'll walk through that tiny labyrinth, through those narrow winding streets, you easily notice that that is how Medina at one point surely would have looked like. Let us cross along the bridge and go inside the city through its archway. You can have a much nicer glimpse at the main gate of Medina. And this new archway was the one built in the year 1724, and it was paid for by one of the Grand Masters of the Order, a Portuguese Grand Master whose name was Antonio Manuel de Villena, that simply wanted as well to build inside Medina a private residence or let us say a weekend retreat because the residence of the Grand Masters was always in Valletta. But then they used to have these weekend retreats in other parts of the island. And for Antonio Manuel de Villena, he had this beautiful palace that I have exactly behind me. A palace that today has been converted into the Museum of Natural History. So this is one of the museums. But then, to the side of it, what used to be its dungeons, its prison cells, has also been opened up as another museum. And there is a display for the period of inquisition that we have had on our island in the 16th century. Have another look at the archway. And right at the top of it, you can see those three figures carved out in limestone. And those are still said to be the three patron saints for Malta. The very first one on the left is Saint Publius, who was the very first bishop we have had on the island. Then the central figure portrays Saint Paul the Apostle, whilst the last figure on the right hand side is Saint Agatha. And Saint Agatha nowadays has become the patron saint of Medina, or at least it is to whom they have dedicated the city after the Sicilian earthquake. And then just underneath Saint Agatha's feet, there is a coat of arms made out of white Carrara marble. And that coat of arms belongs to the oldest surviving noble family still living inside Medina. Their name is family in Guanet, and most probably being the oldest surviving noble family, that is why they were given the permission to place their coat of arms on the main gate of the city. I was telling you that these noble families are the ones that have not only inherited the titles but they have also inherited the family business apart from quite a lump sum of money inheriting the residence as well and all the restorations that these palaces might need being privately owned they have to be paid for by the family the state would never help them financially just because the residence is a private one. And just like family in Guanet, this is one of those four 
400 people living today inside Medina. Let me walk you through the main street and we will be walking past a lot of these privately owned houses. We can stop a bit here. It's for Medina and even this looks just like a backbone for the tiny fortress because this narrow street is the one taking us up to another set of fortification walls to the other side of Medina but right behind me we have one of those palaces belonging to the nobility and this entire block of a residence is the one belonging to family in Guanet the one I told you is the oldest surviving noble family still living inside Medina family in Guanet most probably just like the majority of the noble families inside the city had descended from the Spanish period because the Spaniards were the ones that had introduced a lot of nobility titles here in Malta. Although the palace is huge because it has no less than 100 rooms in it, there are not more than three members of the family that are still living there today. And it is one of those palaces that go back to the beginning of the 17th, 18th century, 18th century mostly beginning because it is after the Sicilian earthquake so even this had to be reconstructed from scratch but luckily it is still lived in so in a way it is still looked after as another residence but apart from having the residence of family in Guanet just behind you this entire block is a convent belonging to Benedictine nuns and they are cloistered nuns so they never move out of the convent and as a cloistered order this is the only one that has survived inside Medina there are not more than seven very elderly nuns living here today because unfortunately although we still have an vocation on the island but we do not have a lot of girls wanting to join a cloistered order they would want to work and they would want to, to help outside the convent rather than staying enclosed all the time over there. But at least in this huge building, yes, there is still a, an order of seven Benedictine nuns living here. We'll just keep on walking through the streets and we'll go up to the main square of Medina. And this is the main square of Medina, so it marks exactly the, the center of the city. And here it is the area, you can get an idea up to where the damages of the Sicilian earthquake arrived. Because for instance, if you look at the house with the purple colored balcony, that goes back to the 18th century. But the other one adjacent to it in the corner, Another palace, in fact, which is adorned with double arched pointed windows, that palace was built in the year 1233. So imagine the damages of the Sicilian earthquake arrived exactly up till that corner. The entire square was destroyed and it had to be rebuilt from scratch. 
In fact, luckily, the nobility that lost their property on this side of Medina were donated money by the Knights of St. John. So in a way, they were going to rebuild their houses gratis, free of charge. So these noble families decided to plan their new houses in the style they preferred most. So that is why you find a, a mingling of architecture in one tiny square, because a lot of people had different ideas in architecture. For instance, a family that enjoyed more the Baroque style, just like this palace we have here in the corner. Or another family that wanted their house to be built in a classical style. This other noble family built their house in a neo-Gothic style. It looks like a place of worship, but that is another private residence. What had to be rebuilt from scratch was also the cathedral. Because they say that the old cathedral of Medina dated back to the 12th century and had a Romanesque style, nothing to do with the Baroque you are seeing today. But luckily, it was one of the grand masters of the order that paid entirely for the construction of a brand new cathedral. And this grand master commissioned a Maltese architect, Lorenzo Gaffa, who planned, built and finished this church within just five years. This cathedral was built between 1697 by 1702 it was finished and it is said to be the most perfect baroque church in its aesthetica all over Malta and if you look at the facade of the cathedral you can see that the main door is flanked by two towers and on each and every tower they've put a circular face the face to your right hand side is a clock and that shows the true hours but the other face to your left is a calendar so that shows the months in the inner circle and the date of the months in the outer circle and both faces function perfectly still since the time they were placed this is the cathedral that i told you is dedicated to both saints peter and paul so most probably inside the church there will still be some remains of the decorations because they might not have put down everything completely now that the feast is over because during the feast the cathedral is all adorned in red damask hangings and they bring out the chandeliers all the gold and the silver where it's taken out but then just the day after the feast they start dismantling and storing away everything let me give you this ticket because you'll need an entrance ticket for the cathedral uh -huh. thing i have exactly behind me and this used to be the seminary of the cathedral for a very long time. Then the cathedral chapter just decided to open it up as a museum. It is not just Baroque, but it has a very Rococo facade, especially when you look at the two giants supporting the balcony. Rather than having columns, they have put two Atlantis, they call them. And also those are chiseled out of limestone and chiseled out by hand tools. The residence of the Maltese Archbishop is this building we have here. So just adjacent to the side of the cathedral. Now that we will be going inside the church, please let me remind you that flash photography inside is prohibited. And poor, but then in another few days they will start pulling off all these decorations and all these embellishments but you can have an idea how a church would be decorated during feast time as you've seen as well when you went to the village of Ormi for St. George's feast and you've seen how ornate the Maltese churches really are when feast time is in the village but as I was telling you this church is dedicated to St. Peter and St. Paul although Poor St. Peter is not really represented inside this church because anything they had done over here has got to do with the life of St. Paul the Apostle. St. Paul is such a popular religious figure amongst the Maltese people that even in the Cathedral of Medina, any design and any decoration mainly portrays the Apostle Paul. So for instance, if you look at the ceiling which is under restorations, there is a fresco 
that portrays scenes from the life of St. Paul and that fresco was painted over by two Sicilian brothers. But if you look right at the far end of the church behind the main altar, there is a squarish painting which represents the conversion of St. Paul when this Greek Jew, whose original name was Saulus, converted to Christianity. He became to be known by the name Paulus or Paul. In fact, the name Paul simply means the, the disciple, the follower of Christ. So instead of persecuting, torturing the Christians, Paul started preaching Christianity. And that is why the Romans considered him to be a traitor. Paul had to die. In fact, the Romans went over to Damascus, grabbed Paul, put him on board a galley, and started their voyage up to Rome. But you know what happened during the voyage. They encountered themselves with such a bad storm that they shipwrecked. And they shipwrecked next to a very small island they came to know was named Melita. And that is how they accidentally, in the year 60 after Christ, ended up over here. So no wonder with the presence of St. Paul in Malta for three whole months, he still has an effect on the Maltese people, above all, an effect on our religious beliefs, being him the one for the very first time introducing Christianity. So not only the frescoes, a lot of the paintings portraying St. Paul, but even if you look above the confessionaries, and even over here and carved out of wood, you always see the figure of St. Paul the Apostle. But apart from having all these paintings and all these frescoes, another lovely jewel inside the church is the floor. Because when you look at the entire floor, it is covered up with these marble tombstones, seemingly like a jigsaw puzzle, literally inlaid in marble. And the majority of these tombstones belong to ecclesiastical Maltese people. So we have bishops and archbishops, old cardinals of Malta, because we have had cardinals representing our island, that then have been buried in the crypt of the cathedral. Even members of noble families have been buried over here, have been because burials inside churches nowadays is prohibited since the 1950s for hygienic reasons. They cannot bury any longer in such a small enclosed space. So what our archbishops are doing today is they are carving out a tombstone. They already prepare a slab so that it would be placed inside the cathedral. When they die, their corpse would be interred somewhere else. It's only out of pride to say I, I have my souvenir already placed inside the cathedral of Medina, but no more burial is allowed today within churches. Although up until the 1950s, it was very popular, not just in the cathedrals, but all over the churches here in Malta, it was very customary to use churches literally as cemeteries as well. But I wanted to show you something else inside this cathedral because Remember I told you there existed an old Romanesque church before the Sicilian earthquake? Because then after the Sicilian earthquake, almost all of it disappeared. But there is something that used to belong to that Romanesque cathedral that has survived the Sicilian earthquake. And it has remained so intact, they are still using it today within this cathedral. So if you would like to see this, souvenir dating back to the 12th century just come along with me to the side chapel and i'll show it to you century remain i was referring to this door that lies exactly behind me at a distance it might seem made out of wrought iron but that is wood one solid piece of carved wood and in fact Nowadays, this is the door leading one into the sacristy of the cathedral. So it is not only used as a storage place, but also the place where the priests would change their vestments in preparation for the service. But have a look at the uppermost part of this door. There are the two saints carved on it. We have Saint Paul with his sword and Peter with the keys leading to heaven just because this tiny doorway was the main entrance of the old cathedral. 
Imagine the old Romanesque cathedral just crumbled to pieces during the earthquake. Its main door, God only knows how, remained intact. But so intact, they wanted to reuse it when they were building this cathedral. Although building quite a big cathedral, this door was too tiny to serve as a main entrance. So they decided to use it just as a door leading into the sacristy. But at least it is in use. It is a 12th century door that is in use. And when you are using something, automatically it will preserve itself in time much better. That is why it doesn't look like a, a piece of wood dating back to the 1100s. And for us, one of the few artifacts that have remained, that have survived from the old cathedral. Let me show you the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament just at the very far end over here. This little chapel that lies exactly beside me is the one housing the Blessed Sacrament, which is not really a Maltese custom to put the Blessed Sacrament away from the main altar. Usually it's always placed on the main altar so that it would be exposed to all the people coming over here. But in this cathedral and in the co-cathedral of Valletta, the Blessed Sacrament always has its private side chapel. Apart from the Blessed Sacrament, another gem that we have over here is that little icon just above the altar. An icon representing Virgin Mary breastfeeding baby Jesus. It is a Byzantinesque icon, as historians have told us, not only Byzantinesque in appearance, but in execution as well. That icon dates back to the 13th century, to the 1200s. This chapel sometimes is used for private functions. For instance, whenever there is only a baptism or maybe an engagement, which is only the blessing of the rings and only a few relatives come along, they can make use of this little chapel rather than the whole church. But then the cathedral is daily open for services and it is used for private functions. Because for instance, the co-cathedral of Valletta, private functions are not allowed over there. But when it comes to funerals or above all, weddings, they are very popular in this cathedral. Weddings are so popular here that one has to book his wedding date with the cathedral chapter not less than two years beforehand. Oh. That's because a lot of Maltese would want not only to get wed in the cathedral of Malta, but above all just because it is the city of Medina. That's what's so fascinating about it. And this time, we will be not only moving out of the cathedral, but moving away from the Baroque side of the city. Let me show you just a tiny bit of Arabic Medina for now, and then we'll see the rest later on. We've come just through a little bit of Arabic Medina because once one goes by the side of the cathedral, this narrow winding route we have over here is already part of the original city in a way, as are original these walls. These are some of the walls that have survived around Medina and you can appreciate the chunky massive defense that they had even just by looking at their width over here. And you can also notice why a lot of people were using Medina as an observation tower. Simply because from these walls you can see not less than three quarters of the island. Although the visibility is a bit hazy today, but if you look to your right hand side, just about two o'clock on the face of the clock, over there we have Valletta. So that's the other capital city. And if we come up to one o'clock on the face of the clock, 
Then we get St. Julian's and the Hilton Tower at the far end. You can always see that. <laughs> right ahead of us, what you can see in the middle is this big circular dome. That's the one we have visited, the village's Mosta, and that is the one I told you is the fourth widest dome in Europe. Then if we go a bit to the left hand side at about 11 o'clock on the face of the clock, we reach St. Paul's Bay. So that's the area attributed to the shipwreck of St. Paul the Apostle. But then further to our left, where all these apartments are situated, that is already Rabat. So the suburb can already be seen from where we are, but if those apartments were non-existent, surely enough one could see up to the northern tip of Malta and even beyond that, surely enough Gozo at the time would have been visible from where we are. They also say that when the visibility is perfect, at night time especially, along the skyline at a distance, one can even see up to Sicily because it lies at just 60 miles away from Malta. So no wonder a lot of civilizations were opting more for Medina, always being on a high spot. So automatically it is a safer spot as well, but they could observe quite a big chunk of our coastal area from where we are. So they could easily see galleys of the enemy approaching our land. If during your free time, you might want to come over to this side and in Fontanella Tea Gardens, especially for those of you not only that enjoy a nice cup of tea or coffee, but for those sweet toothed of you that enjoy mouth watering cakes. This is the place you have to come back to during your free time. Let me walk you along the fortification walls. I will show you something else on the way. Another place you might want to visit as well is the Norman House. This is a palace that until recently was lived in. It dates back as well to the 13th century. We call it a Norman House because it has a Sicilian Norman style, especially with the arched pointed windows. And it has been opened up as a private museum. So you can buy a ticket and also visit this residence over here. Something interesting as well is this convent, which is the one belonging to Carmelite friars. There are just about three friars today living in this convent. The church is open and they've opened up part of the convent as a museum to the public as well, with the refectory that the friars are still using to eat, parts of the, of the rooms used by the friars. The priory itself is all open to the public. So there are quite a lot of things you might want to visit and see inside Medina, the cathedral museum, the tea gardens, gift shops as well, as always, there are gift shops walking along the main street. And if you keep on going straight on, you will reach the main gate of Medina from where we came in. So that's where the Natural History Museum is, and even the dungeons. Stop for coffee. So leaving completely the cathedral square, we've left all of the Baroque and partially medieval side as well of Medina. Now from where we will be walking, this is all of the Arabic side of the city that has survived after the earthquake. But you just have to bear in mind that before the earthquake, all of Medina would have looked just like this little corner that we have today. And when the Arabs had reduced the size of the city after the Roman era, they did Medina more in a labyrinth form. Narrow streets, all of them winding, so you cannot see exactly where the street ends. So that was always done purposely for defense, always trying to hide in the little side alleys during invasions. But there was another side to it. Why did they make narrow streets flanked by tall buildings? 
so as to make shade to the street itself. And just because at the time, when people were traveling, they either did it on foot, either on horseback or donkey back, but they had no luxury in having cars or motorbikes at the time, surely enough. So at least if they were traveling, they would have done it in the shade. And even Rabat, just because Rabat, the suburb, was born mainly during the Arabic dominion, then it is very similar to this side of Medina. And when we will be walking along these streets, notice that a lot of the houses have these door knockers. Just because at the time not everybody used to bother with a bell at the time, so they used to make the door knockers. And some of the most popular are the dolphins, because the dolphin is always a symbol of the Mediterranean. So it turned out to be a, a typical emblem, at least, for an island right in the center of the Mediterranean. And you'll see ones just like these, made out of brass, and there are others which are made out of bronze as well. of Arabic Medina will be going through because very shortly we'll take a different archway as an exit to the city but one of the originals that has still survived and it is that little tunnel from where all the other people are getting through. Now just bear in mind that that tunnel had been dug into the fortification walls. So the whole length of that tunnel marks the width of the walls that we have right ahead of us. So even here you can notice this massive defense that Medina always had surrounding it. As soon as we're out of that tunnel, automatically we'll be walking into the dry moat. Although what you will be seeing today is a parking lot. But that used to be the dry moat originally dug by the Arabs and always revolving around the entire city. Just up a tiny hill and we'll already be in Rabat. So the next square you'll be seeing just a few feet away, then that belongs to the suburb. As soon as we're out of the ditch, then we're leaving Medina behind us. There is a painting just above the arch which can't be seen that well just because of the reflection in the glass and honestly because the window pane is a bit dirty. But it represents St. Paul the Apostle once again. Let us make our way to visit the Roman townhouse now. We've also come to see a townhouse dating back to the Roman era and this still is situated on its original spot. This is where during the Roman period, but at a much lower level, the house itself would have been built, dating back to approximately the second century after Christ, but belonging surely enough to a family that would have been wealthy enough to have their private residence here in Malta and a small residence which they would have been using only during the summer period because on board the van I was telling you that for the Romans Malta was nothing more than a summer residence. Quite logically because if they were only coming over here to refuel their galleys with all the produce they were taking away from the island they would have never really risked traveling in winter or autumn when the sea conditions are not that good. So they would have mostly come over here between 
May, maybe till the beginning of November, that's when the Mediterranean Sea is still very calm. So that's why we always say, coming through those months, that not, Malta was nothing more for them than a summer residence. So being over here for a very short period, just for a season through the year, although Malta was part of the Roman Empire, we cannot say that on the island we have ever had any Roman villas no villas dating back to the Romans were ever discovered. Townhouses, yes, a small house for the short period the family that owned it would have been living in it. And the Latin word for it is a domus. So the house you will be visiting today was nothing more than a Roman domus. But although Malta fell under the Roman rule, we were only considered to be a federation of the Roman Empire. We were not considered to be conquered people. And that was a big advantage for the Maltese. In a way, we were always pushed a bit aside. Malta was just a refueling country for them and nothing else mattered. So at least we know from written documents that during the Roman period, the Maltese, first of all, were allowed to practice their religion. So automatically this shows us that there were no persecutions whatsoever during the Roman era here in Malta, although in the long run even the Maltese converted to Christianity, they could easily dig their catacombs, bury their dead corpses, practice their religion, but at least the Romans never really muddled in the affairs of the Maltese people when it came to their beliefs. They also allowed the Maltese people to have their own governor representing us within the Roman Empire, so a Maltese representative within the Roman Empire, and they even allowed us to coin our own money. So in a way, we were considered to be more of their allies rather than conquered people. But then, although they, they considered us to be their friends, the Romans used to refer to the Maltese people as barbarians. They called us by the Latin word barbari, and they referred to the Maltese as such simply because the Maltese at the time spoke neither Latin nor Greek, the only two languages that were understood by the Romans. So just because the Maltese at the time were still speaking Phoenician and writing that language in the Semitic form, so the Romans never really understood what the Maltese were blabbering amongst them. So knowing the pride the Romans always had, not to minimize their intellect in saying, okay, they speak a language we do not understand. The Romans would have never admitted such a thing. So they would have rather said, they're savage people, they're barbarians, they're non-educated people, because they do not know Latin or Greek at the time. Now, this house was accidentally discovered because in 1881, a group of workers was sent over to Rabat to start digging the area to prepare a set of public gardens. And during the digs they were doing, they accidentally started uncovering beautiful marble statues just like these, and then they kept on with the excavations, going lower in the level, and uncovering this entire house, which most probably, as a house, was situated inside Medina, just because the capital city during the Roman period was larger than it is today. So most probably the family that owned this house was at the time living within the boundary wall of Medina. Then when the Arabs reduced the size of the city, then automatically it just started pertaining more to the suburb, more to Rabat. But from all the things they managed to uncover, they get a good idea. What kind of people were living in this house? How wealthy they might have been just to possess all these beautiful household goods and decorations and mosaic floors for the house itself. So surely enough, it was an important family within the society living in Malta at the time. Now, an interesting thing is that we talk about the Arabic period as well after the Romans. We've spent 200 years ruled by the Arabs. And what do we have dating back to the Arabic period? Almost nothing. Because the Maltese people, as soon as the Arabs left the island, destroyed everything. They destroyed anything that could remind them of the presence of Islam here in Malta. The only objects that have survived are those epitaphs. 
So those are the only Arabic remains we have today here in Malta. And they accidentally discovered them in the whereabouts of this excavation site. And most probably, they were still intact because people didn't know about their existence. Most probably, they were just buried underground. And that's why people left them. Because if they came to know about their existence as well, they would have destroyed them. Because seeing something like that, for them, that, that means Islam, that means a different religion, and it was not accepted by the Maltese people at the time. So unfortunately, we have no, no Alhambras like they have in, in Spain, nothing that reminds us of that Arabic rule, no, no proper architecture that goes back to the Arabic period. The Maltese destroyed everything. Now, when it comes to the different objects they have discovered in the house, some of the most beautiful are the statues. We'll have to talk about them because just bear in mind that this is one solid piece of marble. This is one entire slab that was handcrafted and sculptured as you see it today. Especially not only looking at the dress that the statue itself is wearing with all the pleats and all the details, but when you look at its neckline, there's a beautiful necklace around the neckline and two doves as well, one facing each other, and that was all chiseled out by hand tools. A lot of the statues were discovered headless, but unfortunately the neck is the thinnest part in a statue. So that's the part likely as to break when a statue topples over. So unfortunately, that's why a lot of them were discovered headless. A lot of the heads were discovered, but they do not really know if that specific head belongs then to this particular body. So they've just exhibited them as they had been discovered. I told you that the Maltese people were allowed to coin their own money. Let me show you some of them because they're exhibited just over here engraved on them the word Melitayon, which is written then on this placard right beside me. The word Melitayon means belonging to Malta, or easier than that, made in Malta. So surely enough, these would have been coined on the island. And that was something the Maltese people were free to do as well during the Roman Empire. But let me show you the household goods, just because I mentioned them to you as well. Apart from that, something very interesting is a rattle. Most probably these objects give us a proof that there would have been the presence of children and the baby as well within the family that used to reside in this house. An infant, surely enough, because of the rattle. And the tiny masks, they do not fit an adult face. They're too tiny. They might have been made specifically as toys for the children. And we know how kids like to copy adults. And Romans were very popular for their parties, for their theatrical displays as well. So maybe they used to do the terracotta masks for the children, just as toys at the time. Might have been blown on the island, we do not know. Because always remember, we do not have glass as a raw material here in Malta. Glass would have had to be imported and then worked by local artisans. So most probably, these tiny glass jars we have here would have been readily brought over to Malta. Tiny, especially when you look at the neck, which is very narrow, so they would have housed liquids, mostly, when the neck is so thin. And they might have housed not only embalming oils, perfumes, body lotions as well at the time, particularly for the ladies. Body lotions would have also consisted in olive oil, because olive oil is very rich in vitamin E. And even today, they are adding olive oil in body lotion just because of all the vitamin E that it has. Olive oil was also used by the ladies, as I was telling you last time, to make their intricate hairstyles. And if you look at that glass case we have just over there, there are two heads represented with very voluminous hairstyles. Now, they not only used olive oil as a beauty product, maybe instead of gels or hairspray, since they had none at the time, so to keep up their hairstyle and shape. But mind you, ladies, during the Roman period, women used to use weaves and extensions. 
So we have not invented anything. They were already adding these hair pieces. No wonder they used to have these big hairstyles at the time. But then on this side, we have a lot of pottery ware, and not only, glassware as well, that would have been used in the house. Pots and pans and maybe water jugs or wine jugs as well as what we have over here. Always look at the size of the neck when it comes to the bottle and the jar. The thinner it is, then it is a liquid. And if it is very thin, then it would be olive oil, so that the liquid would only seep out of the jar, but not gush out of it. But then if a pot would have a very big aperture, then it would have been used, surely enough, either for solids or to cook with it. When it comes to terracotta and clay, these would have been manufactured on the island because we do have those materials, so they could have easily been done whilst they were here in Malta. But when it comes to bronze, we do not have any, so that they would have brought over with them on board the galleys as they would have brought with them these very intricate glassware. I mean, have a look at them. They're not in a pristine condition, but quite a percentage of them is still intact. And even these, these go back to the second century after Christ. Now, let you. But at one point, it would have been one complete marble slab. And they believe that this bust belongs to this other part of the statue, which portrays Antonia. Antonia was the daughter of Emperor Claudius and down in the house we have the presence of Claudius as well so if there is the presence of the Emperor as another marble statue it means that the family living in the house at the time was living in the period when Claudius was Emperor of Rome now the only problem is Antonia was his only child being a female she could have never become on her own Empress of Rome so Claudius needed a son, and he adopted one. He adopted Nero. And everybody knows how popular Nero then became in the long run. So Nero was only the adopted son of Emperor Claudius. But his real, let us say, daughter, yes, was Antonia. Have a look at her facial features, so detailed. Unfortunately, the nose was broken and they plastered it over and they specifically did it in a very bright whitish color so that the people know that it is just a reconstruction, it is not original. But then have a look at her hairstyle as well. Not only very intricate at the back because she has a lot of braids at the back going around, which unfortunately you can't see that well, but when you look at the tiny curls on her forehead, how would she have stuck? those so they would have had herpes and they would have used olive oil surely enough for that as well in the whereabouts where today we have the elevator just because this little room by the elevator is known as the atrium the hallway so coming into the house one would have found the atrium then right adjacent to me this room was known as a triclinium which was the dining room and this would have been the room as well where not only the family, yes, would have eaten, but where they would have held parties. We know how popular parties were for the Romans at the time. And if the family would have had a lot of guests, they would have opened up the dining room and the atrium as one big hall for all the guests. Now when you look at the floor, at the mosaic floor, especially in the dining room area and the triclinium, and you look at the frame just beside the walls, the design is very similar to the spiral that we have seen in the temples. Looking like a wave maybe, but very circular, so very similar to the one we've seen in the temples on the altars. Then there is the squarish spiral, this labyrinthine design you can see in the inner border, and also this is entirely made out of mosaic. Mosaic, which is known as vermiculatum, vermi, deriving from worms, a wormy type of mosaic. It is almost like an S-shaped mosaic to be able to do this kind of design. Then the central part of the mosaic is a much bigger mosaic, bigger chunks, and diamond-shaped. And there are three colors, 
white, black and green, so that they would give that three-dimensional effect, that beehive effect when you look at them, when everything here is completely flat. Then on the side, we have the statue representing Emperor Claudius, so that's the father of Antonia. And just beside the elevator in the atrium, we have a very small headless statue, and they believe that that might portray Nero. And Nero only as a young kid, of course, because Emperor Claudius was, was at his prime at the time as an emperor. Part was known as a peristyle. And the peristyle was always an open courtyard. Rain or shine, this would have been left open. So whenever it rained, water would have been drained down through that hole that I have exactly ahead of me. There is a, a drain hole at the other far end, and they would have just seeped the water beneath the courtyard. Nowadays, they've put up a roof, obviously enough for protection, but this would have been left open even just to illuminate the other rooms of the house. The floor inside the peristyle is still the original one, entirely made out of mosaic. The innermost frame, another time, looks just like the spiral in the prehistoric temples. And then the central emblem bears a golden cistern with a dove and a pigeon, also made out of mosaic. Now, this peristyle would have been surrounded by 16 Doric columns. One of the original columns is the heavily eroded one. But then right adjacent to it, they reconstructed another column, just to give you an idea how these Doric columns would have looked like. 16 of them surrounding this beautiful courtyard. And just above the columns, there is a frame, which at the time would have also been made out of limestone, just like the columns. And that is known as an abacus. And the abacus would have gone all around the upper part of the peristyle, just as an additional embellishment above the columns. Then in the other glass containers, you will see just fragments of other decorations that would have been found inside the house. Even oil lamps, for instance, made out of terracotta as well. Drain pipes, like the ones we have over here, made out of terracotta. And jars, the famous amphorae, they used to carry around with them as well on board the galleys. And that is why they have this cone-shaped bottom because these would have been hung on board the galleys. They wouldn't have been placed flat on the ground because swaying to and fro, surely enough, they would have broken easily. So they would have just hung them against the wall of the galley. And this is more of the excavation site. <clears throat> Right by the home that we just, in the museum that we just saw. <clears throat> 